All right, chapter 14, part four of four. The late afternoon breeze flapped the pennants of sailboats moored against the town wharf. It blew in Slally's hair as she followed Steve Slattery toward the boathouse. He looked at her once and smiled. Slally didn't smile back. Steve unlocked the boathouse door. Now you can do it, whispered the wind in the heat. Come here, Steve said. Slally walked over to the boathouse door. She peered into a low-ceilinged room cluttered with tackle and a rack of masts in the middle of the floor. She smelled rope. Over there, said Steve's voice behind her, against the wall. Slally saw a green sailboat rudder leaning against the wall on the far side of the room. Go get it, Steve said. Slally hesitated. She didn't look at him. She didn't know why she was frightened. She, didn't, she couldn't think of any reason for not obeying. She stepped down into the room and climbed over the rack of masts. She lost her balance and fell onto the floor. She heard the door slam shut. She raised her head up over the masts. Steve was locking the door. Then he turned. He wasn't smiling any more. Charlie Phoebe hunkered down into the brush beside the road, his arms propped across his bent knees. The road led past Emson's stone-crushing works in Tysonville. In his left hand, Charlie clutched a pint bottle wrapped in a brown paper bag. He looked up at the hill. The confidence that the whiskey had brought to him was giving, uh, giving way to stupor. Charlie looked at the stunted trees on the top of the hill. He saw a party of blueberry pickers on the lower slope. They had waved as a state police helicopter flew over fifteen minutes earlier. Charlie had driven through the night and the long day with the same desperation that had impelled him uh, through, th through the striving, hoping, disappointing years of his life, and he had found nothing. He had searched every back road, lake, and ruined farmhouse he knew of in the direction the boy had gone, but there were no signs of the damn Ellicott kid. He raised his free hand and swatted at a swarm of gnats that danced in the heavy air before his face. His brain was getting numb. His vision wobbled like the uh, jigging insects a few inches from his eyes. The late afternoon sunlight burned through the leaves and shone on a green halo around the place where Charlie squatted. Willie Bill's pickup truck was parked behind him, its front end pointing down in into the brush. He lifted the bottle and tried to shake a last few drops into his mouth. He wanted to feel the singing of the whiskey because it kept his brain clear bottle was empty. He threw it across the road, trying to smash it against a stone wall. The bottle sailed over the stones and swished into the woods. Charlie put his head in his arms. The bed of glittering jewels dimmed in his mind with the fading of his drunken senses. All he needed to do to get the jewels was to kill the Ellicott kid, but he couldn't find the little bastard. He fought off sleep. He lifted his head and tried to focus his swirling eyes on the jumble, jumbled stones of the collapsed wall. Charlie Phoebe worshipped a god of desperations, and the god heard his silent lament. His sense of movement, he, or he sensed a movement to his right. He swayed forward and looked down the road. He saw Bentley Ellicott crawling out of the bushes. The kid stood up slowly on the road. His clothes were torn and he was dirty. He looked scared. Bits of twig and grass were matted in his hair. Charlie rolled backward and scra scrambled down the embankment behind him. He grabbed for the pickup truck's door handle. The shotgun was right inside, leaning on the seat. Then he remembered the blueberry pickers on Indian Hill. They'd sure as hell see him if he blasted the little son of a bitch away in broad daylight. Charlie wriggled up through the heavy covered, covering brush. He peered through the leaves. Bentley was limping, limping toward him. The kid's mouth was half open, and his dark eyes were fixed on the brushy rise of Indian Hill. Charlie drew back in among the br branches and roots. He covered his head with his arms as Bentley walked past him. A car came down the Tysonville Road, going the other way. It left a swirl of dust that drifted down through the green light, surrounding Charlie Phoebe. Charlie lay still. His reawakened mind cast up what it would be like when he had the little bastard between the barrel ends of the shotgun. Charlie could spatter the kid's brains all over the landscape. 
Thinking about it was almost as pleasurable as thinking about the sapphires, rubies, and mountains of diamonds that Charlie's god would give him when Bentley Ellicott was dead. People running. People poised just before running. The whole of Main Street had been shattered by the screaming. As McGraw drove past the hardware store, his weary brain took in everything, as if he were watching a slow-motion movie. Polly in her drugstore apron, her blonde hair flying behind her as she leapt across a pothole. Elias Cutter sta um, standing beside his car, staring at the boathouse where the screams had come from. Nick Mattis running down the wharf from the freezing plant. Dick Amberstam sprinting from the police station, the screen door banging wide and Dick's elbow jutting out behind him as he reached for his thirty eight in its leather holster. In the same bloat of time and vision, McGraw accelerated his cruiser, nearly hitting Polly, passing Elias Cutter. McGraw twisted the, twisting the steering wheel hard to the right, his weight slamming into the door as the tires spit gravel, the police car skidding onto the stone approach of the wharf, heading directly toward the boathouse door. Dick Amberstam floated in, floating into his field of vision as McGraw hit the parking brakes and simultaneously threw open the cruiser door and swung himself out, thinking it was funny that a young fellow like Dick should be going bald. McGraw turned his body so that the back of his shoulder would take the impact of his body on, on the boathouse door. The door split apart under the force of McGraw's 240 pounds, and McGraw went uh, with the broken pieces into the gloom, seeing the yellow eyes of the beast, smelling rope as he hurtled across the racks of masts, grabbing Steve Slattery by the hair, taking the trouserless adolescent with him over the masts and hard against the wall, with tackle and ironware showering down around them. Steve tried to bellow as McGraw lifted him, but one hand choked off his windpipe and the other was gripped around his leg. He was rising against the ceiling and was about to be flung across the room so that his back would be broken and the devil in him murdered when Dick Amberstam's revolver barrel smashed across McGraw's forehead. The boathouse exploded with the dead light of the northern sky and the yowls of the teenager as McGraw took Steve, stinking of evil, into the red pane where the rage and weariness stopped. Someone was weeping, someone trying to weep, and a terrible dry choking noise taking the place of sobs. McGraw leaned back, uh, leaned the back of his head against the stone wall of the boathouse. His eyes were open, and he saw solicitous figures hovering over him with the oblong of light of the door behind them. He knew that one of the figures was Dick, and McGraw said, uh, said it before Dick said it. You had to. Hell, you had to do it. Don't worry about it. You had to do it because I must have gone off my head for a minute there. It's not having any sleep that did it. Could have happened to anybody, Dick said in front of him. I'm sorry, McGraw. You had to do it, McGraw said again. He wanted to cry. The dead light receded and McGraw began to see. Dick, Nick Mattis, and Elias Cutter crouched before him. To one side of him he heard the weeping and strangling noise. McGraw moved his eyes and looked at his deputy. What was it? He tried to rape her, Dick answered quietly. Sit still, Mr. McGraw, Elias Cutter said. Dr. Leon's on the way. Who? McGraw asked. The Drake girl, Dick said. McGraw closed his eyes because the fearfulness of it blinded him anyway. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat upon him was Death, and Hades followed with him, and power was given them over the fourth part of the earth. The dead light had dimmed, but it wasn't gone. It hovered over the world, sickening it with the revelation of the archdemon that was nourished by the night. McGraw knew that he had to see it all. He opened his eyes and looked to his left. He saw Polly holding Slally against her breast, rocking and crying, and the little girl's eyes were wide. Her mouth was open, as if she were making a scream that McGraw couldn't hear. Polly looked back at him. Her grief was his own, but he didn't know yet what they grieved for. She can't make a sound, Polly wailed. Oh, God, McGraw, she's been struck dumb. And having done this, Prince Omber rose from the shadows as McGraw's heart wept. The Lord of Nightmares turned toward the uplands where his enemy had stopped. The pale light became the shape of a horse, and Prince Omber mounted it and rode to the place where the day was dying and gunfire would herald death in the night. Bentley opened his eyes. The western sky looked as if a bloody hand had been smeared across it. He was sitting at the end of a grassy track that led off the road, down to a picnic table and the benches at the, at the foot of Indian Hill. Bentley had sat down to rest with his back against a tree. He realized that he must have fallen asleep. 
He got to his feet, yawned, and shut his mouth. His bruised arm ached. He didn't feel hungry anymore, just scared. The afternoon sunshine was gone. He looked at Indian Hill above him. A towering rock was on his left. The people picking blueberries he'd seen when he got there were gone. The red streaks of sunset disappeared into the top of the hill, where he could see low trees growing. He commanded me to put the stone there, the dying bobcat had whispered, among the roots of the oldest flowering tree. Bentley listened. He heard in the distance the roaring sound of earth-moving machinery. He heard three sharp whistles. He looked up into the sky. He'd been following his hawks all through the afternoon, trying to catch up with them. As he stood at the foot of the hill, they were circling directly above him, high in the waning fire of the sun. Suddenly the ospreys tilted their wings and swooped toward the earth. Bentley raised his arms to them. The birds cruised in a wide sweep around him, forty feet from the ground. Then, with a whistle, the fishhawks rose again into the red flares of the sun. They beat their wings and were gone before the uh, gone toward the east, where a new night was gathering. Bentley Ellicott had lost his magic. Heaven's light was dimming before the power of Lord Ombra. And that's chapter fourteen.